God of our fathers, whose almighty hand helped us to recover from a disastrous attack at Pearl Harbor and led us to the end of the war in Tokyo Bay, be present with us as we gather today to set apart this ground as the place where a memorial will be built, a memorial that will help all people to remember those who served in World War II and especially to honor those who died during that global conflict. As President Lincoln said, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men and women who fought in World War II and served in World War II will consecrate this land. Bless this place, O Lord our God, and the hallowed soil from the military cemeteries around the world so that from this ground there shall arise an appropriate monument and memorial for all those who fought and all those who died in World War II. To the honor and glory of thy holy name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the invocation for today's ceremony was given by retired Captain John Craven, who as a Navy chaplain in World War II served throughout the Pacific with the United States Marine Corps 4th Division. He is also a veteran of the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Hugh L. Carey, Vice Chairman of the American Battle Monuments Commission and a World War II veteran who fought in Europe as a member of the New York National Guard. President Clinton, members of Congress, Secretary Brown, Secretary Perry, General Shali Kashvili, fellow veterans, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this site of sights, a glorious location, and what a place to have a bivouac. I'm you, Carrie, and I'm here in two capacities. As Vice Chairman of the American Battle Monuments Commission, a position I'm honored to fill, and more importantly, as an infantry combat veteran of World War II in Europe. Like many in this audience, what brings me to this place and to this day is not simply the wish to pay tribute to our victory. It's more personal than that. For me, the Second World War was a rite of passage. It was my Iliad and my Odyssey a farewell to innocence, an awakening to the world and to the sweep of history. The war lifted me out of the safe and parochial confines of my Brooklyn neighborhood. It made me part of the greatest and most powerful army in the history of the world. I was moved and changed by some of the things I saw and experienced in the war by the extraordinary resilience of the American fighting man, 
and by his endurance, courage, and sense of humor, by the pain and sacrifice of those who fell in battle, by the grief and bravery of their families, by the determination of the American people who stood united on every front in Europe, Asia, and at home in defense of democracy. The war taught me about the greatness Americans can achieve when they find a common purpose. It taught me other lessons as well, lessons contained in James Joyce's lament that history is a nightmare from which we cannot awake. The war took me to the very heart of that nightmare, to fields littered with the dead and dying, to shattered cities and ruined landscapes and ultimately to the very gates of hell, to the grounds of concentration camps and those depraved factories of torture and extermination. My experience was only one of millions. Others fought on different fronts. They witnessed different battles, different tragedies, different victories. But each of us, I believe, was never the same. In the end, each of us understood better than ever before what a precious, fragile possession freedom is. Each of us knew that our liberty and safety and the liberty and safety of free people everywhere could only be preserved if we were willing to pay the cost. This memorial will honor and record the achievement of all those men and women who paid those costs, some with their very lives. As Lincoln so eloquently and wisely noted, their sacrifices, I quote, far above our poor power to add or detract. Nevertheless, I pray that this monument, this memorial, will stand as one measure of our devotion. As chairman of the American Battle Monuments Commission, a position I'm honored to fill, that's the wrong line. <laughs> Wet grounds. You are really in luck. I do pray that though we old soldiers are all destined to fade away, this memorial will remind the generations of what we believed and what we achieved and at what price. The memorial that will rise on this magnificent site will flank the spectacular center line of the National Mall. Nothing will obstruct it. We envision a part of the memorial on one side to one of those who served in the armed forces, a part on the other side to one of those who served on the home front, both enshrining the ideals of peace and freedom for which all Americans struggled for all these long years. I want to take this opportunity to especially express my appreciation to the members of the American Battle Monuments Commission who fought so hard for this site, Ambassador Hayden Williams, General Foote, Raleigh Kidder, and as well to the staff of the President of the United States and the President for persevering and working hard to clear the way in a nonpartisan way to essentially give us this site. As well, I want to express my appreciation to Jess Hay of the Memorial Advisory Commission, who all the way with us cooperated and helped to get this day before us today. In addition, let me say this, on this site, we will erect a lasting memorial. We will indeed make this a shrine of consecration to those who fought so hard and so well to give us our liberty. This is the kind of day perhaps that reminds us that all is not well in this world. There are dark clouds ahead and very severe storms that face us. But if we will persevere, if we will summon up again the courage and determination of those who fought so hard in World War II, we shall prevail. We shall prevail. 
And this, this great monument says something else. If we will put all of our efforts together, as I implore you to do, we shall put on this site with the artistry and gifted crafts that we can summon to this position a proud monument memorial to the greatness of our country. And I ask you today to lift your hearts and pray with me that our work, this work, will truly be God's own. God bless you and God bless America. Our next speaker is the Honorable Peter Wheeler, Chairman of the World War II Memorial Advisory Board. Mr. President, World War II veterans and their families, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Fifty years ago, this country began welcoming home some very incredible heroes. The brave men and women who served this country during World War II. Today, we welcome some of those same heroes, their families, and friends to this occasion. A half a century has passed since World War II ended. A lifetime, really. It has been a lifetime that many young Americans, men and women, lost. No one can deny that the cost of freedom is very high. But the lifetime of freedom they delivered is priceless. We World War II veterans owe thanks to many people for ensuring that there will be a memorial here in the nation's capital, honoring all those who participated in the most important event in the 20th century. There are many we'd like to thank. My dear friend, Sonny Montgomery over there, who will be leaving Congress this year. And, and Mr. Chairman, we're going to miss you very much. One in particular, though, is Congressman Marcy Kaptur. She took up the cause of World War, the World War II Memorial and introduced legislation to create it. On behalf of all Americans of the World War II generation, we thank you. We thank you. As a, thank you. As the chairman of the President's Advisory Board for the World War II Memorial, we welcome you to this great ceremony this afternoon. And God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. The next speaker is the Honorable Marcy Kaptur, representative from Ohio. Reverend clergy, Mr. President, distinguished Ladies and gentlemen, what a rare privilege to be assembled here in our nation's capital on this Veterans Day in the year 1995, five years shy of a new century. From today forward, our nation permanently memorializes that profound period in world history that forged the 20th century. So long as there exists a United States of America, this ground, hallowed with the ashes of our slain brethren from all fronts, will commemorate devotion 50 years ago that elevated duty, honor, 
and country to sacred proportion. No words uttered here today will capture fully the eternal debt we, the children of freedom, owe these men and women who rose above common measure and wrought victory over tyranny, preserving freedom for this generation. Our words fall short of the feelings we hold in our hearts and the memories that endure. Only poetry and music or reflection in absolute silence can encompass the magnitude of what we wish to dedicate. At the end of the war, E.B. Sledge wrote in his memories, sitting in stunned silence, we remembered our dead, so many dead, so many bright futures consigned to the ashes of the past, so many dreams lost in the madness that had engulfed us. Except for a few widely scattered shouts of joy, the survivors of the abyss sat hollow-eyed, trying to comprehend a world without war. Now, 50 years since the signing of the peace accords that ended World War II, we are lifted by the words of Alfred Lord Tennyson in Ulysses that something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. The idea of democracy, now triumphant at the end of the 20th century, demands full enlargement by the world's freedom seekers. And so, as we celebrate victory, let us ask ourselves the ultimate question, can humankind build peace with democracy without war? With us today is one veteran who deserves particular recognition, for he inspired the very conception of this memorial. Army veteran Roger Durbin of Berkey, Ohio, fought with the 10th Armored Division in the Battle of the Bulge. After a visit to our nation's capital, Roger came to me as his representative to ask why, with all the monuments and memorials in this city, there was none dedicated to World War II. Today, we answer his question. And we thank Congressman Sonny Montgomery of Mississippi for his constancy through the legislative process, as well as President Bill Clinton and President George Bush, who made this moment possible. In introducing our next speaker, America pays tribute today to those on the home front, including 16 million women who served at home and 300,000 who served in uniform. We commemorate all the Rosie the Riveters, like my mother and yours. We laud those who steadfastly manufactured the tools of war, who produced the food and fiber to feed and clothe our troops, who sailed the ships, ran the railroads, and flew the planes to supply our fighting forces. Helen Boyajan embodies all American heroines of that war. As a textile worker, she sewed parachute panels at the Atlantic Parachute Works in Lowell, Massachusetts, perhaps even the chute that carried my brave uncles behind enemy lines on the China-Burma-India front and onto the beaches of Normandy. While Helen's husband and three brothers were in the service, she worked hard, second shift, six days a week, making parachutes for the duration, supporting the war effort in every theater of operations. Today, Helen helps America remember those who toiled on the home front as she volunteers at the Lowell National Historical Park, reminding visitors again of those millions of Americans who more than self, their country loved, and mercy more than life. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Helen Boyajan.
Thank you, Congressman. Can Congressman, I'm sorry. Congresswoman Kepter for your warm introduction. I'm proud to be here today on behalf of all those nameless people who worked on the home front for our boys. We all worked together. We inherited our brother's chores. We worked at jobs that were unfamiliar and difficult. Thank you. But we were adventurous. We were all working toward the same goals, the same cause. We were all the same. We were all Americans. We were proud of our work. We thought about every stitch that went into the making of a parachute, about how careful we had to be, because we knew who would be using them, our boys. So many nameless faces fighting for America, so many young men, far away from home, protecting our freedom and democracy. I am proud to have been able to do my, sure, my share, and I'm very proud to look out at this crowd, at the generation of veterans and home front workers that we honor today. I will always remember, I'll always be proud, to have been a part of the We Can Do It spirit that swept across America after all, we did it for our brothers. We did it for our fathers. We did it for our husbands. We did it for our boys. Thank you. The United States Army Band and Chorus will now present a musical tribute, Testament of Freedom.
Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General John Shalikashvili. Mr. President, distinguished guests, fellow veterans. In 1939, after 20 years of restless peace, war once again ignited in Europe. But this time, it spread far further across the rolling hills of Central Europe, to the beaches of France, to north and to east, and on throughout the mountains of Italy. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General John Shalikashvili. Mr. President, distinguished guests, fellow veterans. In 1939, after 20 years of restless peace, war once again ignited in Europe. But this time, it spread far further across the rolling hills of Central Europe, to the beaches of France, to north and to east, and on throughout the mountains of Italy until all of Europe was engulfed, and then on to the sands of North Africa, and on to the other side of the world, to Pearl Harbor, and to every tiny island and every grand nation of the Pacific. And when it ended six years later, this greatest saga of human suffering had become the noblest triumph of good over evil. Now, for the past four years, at nearly every spot where blood of our heroes had touched the ground or the sea, we have commemorated the tragedies and the triumphs of World War II. We have paid tribute to the men and women who gave so freely of their talents, who gave so fully of their youth, and who gave so very selflessly of their lives. Our tributes to these courageous men and women have been the wreath we have tossed on the waters where they fought, and the prayers we have said on the battlefields and in the cemeteries where many of our heroes lie today. Our tributes have been the words that have so inadequately described their sacrifices and our gratitude and the enormous debt our nation owes to them and to their families. But today at last, at this final 50th anniversary event, here in the midst of our nation's capital, on this day dedicated to our heroes, to you, our veterans, we have gathered to dedicate a piece of ground upon which your so well-deserved monument will stand so that your deeds may be glorified for all days to come. And I'm enormously proud to stand among you as our 50th anniversary commemorations come to a close to proclaim once again your extraordinary sacrifices and your courage and your determination and devotion to peace and freedom. And I'm pleased as well to have this opportunity to introduce to you one of the thousands of very extraordinary American men and women who have so valiantly and so tirelessly fought to make the world a better place. At the outbreak of war in Europe, at the tender age of 16, he joined the National Guard. And four years later, he was commissioned a second lieutenant and a pilot in the Army Air Corps. Soon, he found himself flying over North Africa and Europe in a tempestuous struggle for the skies that is legendary to every man and woman who has ever flown. In February of 1944 over Italy, on his 66th combat mission, he was wounded and shot down and remained a prisoner of war for 15 months until Soviet forces liberated the camp where he had been interned. By the time he retired in 1971, he had served in uniform for 33 years, fought in three wars, 
World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, was shot down twice, over Italy and then over Korea, flew a total of 245 combat missions, received three Distinguished Flying Crosses, 14 Air Medals, and two Purple Hearts. And so, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you this distinguished military officer, this great patriot, this great American. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Colonel Miguel Encinas. Thank you very much, General Shelly Kashvili. Thank you again, General. Uh, President Clinton, good afternoon and buenos dias. Bonjour, my fellow veterans of World War II and veterans all over the world. Fellow Thunderbirds of the 45th Division and Beagles of the 2nd Squadron, 52nd Fighter Group, ladies and gentlemen. I am from New Mexico, where in 1998, we are celebrating the 400th anniversary of our founding, the oldest continuous European settlement within the 50 states. To some of you, World War II must seem like something which happened in the dim, remote past. But to me, and I am sure to most of its veterans, a host of scenes remain crystal clear. Maybe it's because of the special kind of mission which in 1941 our country undertook and passed on to its young sons and daughters. War is never pretty. To many, it is an indescribable horror, but it can also be something else. When it became obvious that our involvement was imperative, and not only because of Pearl Harbor, the war became a crusade. But to most veterans, probably only in retrospect, because we were a little bit busy. It was a war of liberation of countries like my wife's France, which came under the hobnail boot of occupation. It was also a war of deliverance of innocent people who were herded into horror camps and slaughtered out of simple irrational hatred by a grotesque regime, which Germany and virtually every nation in the world has since acknowledged as such and repudiate it. How could we not fight such a war? The miracle is that fighting two superpowers on two very different fronts, we could win in three and a half years. But the fact is that it was no miracle, but a wondrous, prodigious effort and unity of purpose on the part of all our people. On the battlefronts, our soldiers, Marines, sailors, airmen, and Coast Guardsmen fought with a minimum of complaint or self-pity. Our women rolled up their sleeves and helped build the tanks, ships, and airplanes, which our largely amateur fighting men use so well. It could be very well that I used one of Helen Boyajian's parachutes when I bailed out. And I thank all those who worked at the uh, home front for the victory that, that was ours. After the war, for the first time in history, a triumphant country helped the defeated enemy countries get back on their feet. And then the great man who followed the fallen leader desegregated the armed forces. After that, could general desegregation be far behind? As it turned out, under such a policy, our military services have never been more sharply honed nor more professional. Another remarkable outcome of the war was the GI Bill of Rights. Veterans received a reward in our, that in our wildest dreams we could hardly have imagined, a chance at higher education. I am proud to be one of the 2.2 million veterans who took advantage of that stroke of the pen which democratized education in our country. A noted columnist said recently when writing about the GI Bill of Rights, who says that government can't do anything right or well? Now my hope is that we are not regressing from such a spirit, from doing what needs to be done for the common good, not only at home, but in a troubled world. As World War II demonstrated so dramatically, we are above all a nation and not just an agglomeration of individuals. All these things happen thanks to the Colossus in a wheelchair 
and to the plain-spoken political genius who followed him, Franklin D. Roosevelt and Harry S. Truman. And now it is time to hear from another leader of another time and other circumstances, which in different ways are always just as trying. It is with great pride and esteem that I ask you to welcome our Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vincinius, for that introduction and for your truly remarkable service to our nation. General Warner, Governor Kerry, Chairman Wheeler, Congresswoman Kaptur, I thank you all for what you have done to bring us to this day. I want to thank Mr. Durbin for his idea and for the triumph of his idea today, and the triumph of the idea that an American citizen can have a good idea and take it to the uh, proper authorities and actually get something done. <laughs> to all the members of Congress, and especially to Congressman Montgomery on his retirement for all of his service to our veterans. To Mrs. Boyajan, thank you for your wonderful remarks today. General Charlie Kashfili, Secretary Perry, Secretary Brown, my fellow Americans. I would like to begin by asking on the occasion of this last observance of the 50th anniversary of World War II that all of us express our appreciation to those who served on the World War II Commemorative Commission, and especially to its leader, General Kicklider, for a magnificent job. Thank you all, and thank you, General. <laughs> on this Veterans Day, we gather in special memory of World War II, and we dedicate this site to ensure that we will never forget. That war claimed 55 million lives, soldiers and civilians, children, the millions murdered in the death camps. It engulfed more of the earth than any war before it, or any war since. It was, as Governor Kerry said, the coming of age, not only for many Americans, but for America. The moment that we understood that we could save the world for freedom, and only we could save the world for freedom, and so we had to do it. Today we honor those who did just that, the fighting men and women who wore our uniform all around the world, and the millions of civilians on our nation's home front who did the remarkable things embodied by Mrs. Boyakin for all they did for our troops and for all they did without, all the sacrificing at home to help the cause abroad, we thank them too. My fellow Americans, the World War II generation emerged from the darkness of global war to strengthen our economy, to enlighten our society, and to lead our world to greater heights. More than 16 million women worked in our factories and cared for our soldiers. After the war, they began to play a larger role in our economy and, over time, a remarkable role in our military. Many thousands of African Americans served their country with courage and distinction as Tuskegee Airmen and Triple Nickel Parachutes, as Sherman, ta Sherman Tank Drivers and Navy Seabees. After the war, we began slowly to act on a truth too long denied that if people of different races could serve as brothers abroad, surely, surely, they could live as neighbors at home. I cannot let this moment pass without expressing my gratitude to all those of other ethnic and racial groups who themselves knew discrimination, who also served in World War II, 
and the especially brave and heroic Japanese Americans who served in World War II, many of them with their own relatives in internment camps. All these people took a fuller and larger and more meaningful role in American life after the war, and we were stronger for it. And instead of turning its back on the world the way the previous generation did after World War I, the World War II generation stood with its allies and reached out to its former adversaries to cement the partnerships and create the institutions that secured half century of unparalleled prosperity in the West, no return of world war, and victory in the Cold War. We owe that generation a very great deal, and this monument will tell us we must never forget that either. This memorial, whose site we dedicate today, will be a permanent reminder of just how much we Americans can do when we work together instead of fighting among ourselves. It will honor those who served and those who made the ultimate sacrifice. It will pay tribute to the millions of civilians who supported the war effort in spirit and action. It will stand as a monument to the values that joined us in common cause, that are worth defending, and that make our life worth living. All these things we must never forget. Here in the company of President Lincoln and President Jefferson, the White House in which every president but George Washington has lived, and the monument to George Washington just behind you, with the stately Capitol dome beyond, the World War II Memorial will join the ranks of our greatest landmarks because it was one of the greatest and most important periods in our history. We will seal this plaque soon with the earth of 16 World War II cemeteries. And so, in our small way, infuse this place with the spirit and the souls of those who died for freedom. I want to thank all of those who have worked so hard to raise the funds for this project, including my good friend Jess Hay from Dallas. I want to thank Secretary Perry and the Department of Defense for making an initial contribution. And to all of you in the future who will give to make sure that this project is done and done right, I thank you. America must never forget the debt we owe the World War II generation. It is a small down payment on that debt to build this monument as magnificently as we can. From this day forward, this place belongs to the World War II generation and to their families. Let us honor their achievements by upholding always the ideals they defended and by guarding always the dreams they fought and died for, for our children and our children's children. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, President Clinton, accompanied by Mr. Roger Durbin, will now unveil the plaque that will officially mark the site where America's World War II memorial will be built. in concert with its allies over the forces of totalitarianism this side of our world war ii memorial will now be consecrated with the soil collected from 16 american cemeteries overseas for united states world war ii service members 
gave their all for this great nation and are laid to rest. The cemeteries are maintained by the American Battle Monuments Commission and the Department of Veteran Affairs. These cemeteries are located on the land fought over in many of the war's major battles. These 16 cemeteries are listed in your program. Ladies and gentlemen, joining President Clinton and Mr. Durbin is Master Philip Mangus, a Gold Star grandson whose grandfather Maurice is buried in the American Cemetery in Margaretton. They will lead a distinguished delegation in placing soil from the hallowed grounds of American cemeteries upon this memorial site. Assisting the official party with the mixing of the soils are Mr. Alfred Los Panos, a United States Army veteran of World War II, Mr. William Ferguson, United States Army Air Force and Tuskegee Airmen, Ms. Sarah McClendon, a veteran of the Women's Army Corps, Mr. J. William Murphy, United States Marine Corps veteran. Warrant Officer Betty Swing, a Coast Guard spawn during World War II, and the first female Warrant Officer in the United States Coast Guard. And Ambassador Hayden Williams, a Navy veteran of World War II and member of the American Battle Monuments Commission.